Hello and welcome to episode 97 of The Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by my co-host, Lance LaDuke, or as Google Assistant calls him, Lance LaDuke. Lance, how are you today? I'm (laughs) A-O-K-A. We have got a listener's choice episode for these lovely people today. Which listener? We're only talking to one listener. We're li- we're talking to one listener, and they know who they are. If you if you're wondering if it's you, it's not. So, the today's episode we are going to talk. We we get this question quite a bit, but it's about forming a new brass group. So we're going to get to that in in just a second. So do you, do you have any anything pressing that you need to share with with everyone, Lance? Yes, I can't wait to find out what we say. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness that's that's pretty funny there you go uh just to to help you know like radio announcers uh, uh you know of a sports contest like to paint a picture uh, lance has the uh, the overhead interrogation light off for his video so i can actually see him whereas sometimes it's just like the blinding light from above so i can't really see his face so it's um yeah just you know just trying to paint a picture and he looks good especially Working for, this for early you. in the morning mm-hmm. we want to thank our patreon patrons if you are interested in a whole bunch of bonus content actually our last bonus episode was pretty good stuff wasn't it i think so too yeah there's uh, well there's there's been a few recently that have been that have been really good but uh, one of them actually was uh, well. The the one with Jen uh, Murata was the um, was the most recent one, and then we also had uh, one with Gail Robertson, and uh, and Jeff Connor. We spoke to our former knucklehead Hi. colleague. We we talked to him for a half an hour actually. So that was like a, almost like a full blown interview. Um, well, since, especially because he didn't realize that we were done. Like he just. They just kept talking. It was pretty funny, and I kept trying to wrap it, and then Jeff kept <laughs> asking us questions, so which was which was very funny. So, and I... uh, and that entire bonus episode you can hear uh, starts with him because I said, "Okay, we're going to record," and then because it's an involuntary thing for him, he started and he went. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> to which I said, "I'm not editing that out. That just started with an old uh, Jeff Connor sigh, which." Lance and I, I, w- I was going to say, have heard tens of thousands of times, but we have caused tens of thousands of times, I think, is a, is a much more accurate way to put it. So, hi. Hi. So, if you go to patreon.com slash the brass junkies, then for as little as $1 an episode, which is a whopping $26 for the entire year, which is about the half the cost of one lunch with no alcohol in Zurich, Switzerland. You can get uh, 26 bonus episodes every single year. There's also some other bonus content that we throw up there as well. So, again, you can go to patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies uh, to learn more about that. We also want to thank everyone who's gone to iTunes and left a rating and a review. Thank you so much. That is the best way for you to help us uh, in a real easy way to have the podcast found by other people. So, I'm not going to speak particularly well today because I was up until almost four in the morning watching a baseball game in the World Series and my team lost and I should have gone to bed at like 11 and I didn't. And uh, so that's that's really awesome. That has me in a really good headspace. So, uh, Lance, if you if you say anything incorrect, I'm probably just going to yell at you. So um, which I think the people will actually probably find pretty entertaining and it will also be entertaining. It'll be extra entertaining to them that you will genuinely not care. So that's the that <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, I I think that's it. Patreon, iTunes plug. I hate baseball, and um and yeah, I think that that's it. So, so uh, first of all, we want to thank Becky from Omaha for sending in this email. You can email us pedalnotemedia at gmail dot com. You can email us and uh, with any ideas. This is our fourth, I believe, listeners' choice episode where we will um, we will wax poetic and, and provide value to you listeners actually not really but uh, we will answer your questions and so uh, go ahead and uh, keep those coming uh, we we are going to still primarily be doing interviews of course but uh, but we do like to throw these in from time to time so the the question that Becky asks is if you were just starting out today how would you go about forming a new brass group so Lance what what do you say to Becky? 
Well, the first question I always ask is, why would you want to do that? <laughs> it's true. And I've, I've been I get a quizzical look, and they go, well, it's, uh, it, it's, to many people, it's just so self-apparent. Well, I want to start a brass quintet because you were in a brass quintet, and brass quintet is fun, so let's do brass quintet. And so I, um, my sort of snarky question is related to the fact that there's a whole bunch of brass quintets. So why do you want to start a group is a better question. And I think that playing chamber music is, that's definitely my favorite way of, uh, of making music. And so I'm all in on wanting to do that. But I think that there's sort of two paths. One can just be, I want to get better at playing chamber music. I don't really want to spend tons and tons of time um, looking around for tunes. I don't care if I can't make bank doing it. Um, I have some buddies and we all like the repertoire and we just want to get together and maybe make a few bucks playing some weddings and some ceremonies and play through the cool repertoire. Hey, I'm in. You should do that. If you want to do it for a living, then it's a very, very different conversation uh, for lots of reasons. So um, you so, want me to can keep pontificating or do you want to jump in? So why, Becky? <laughs> <laughs> why? Yeah, no, why we'll, do you want to do it? We'll, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll hang up and wait for your answer. That's what lots of people <laughs> like to say on Sports Talk Radio. So I don't think Becky's going to answer since this was an email. But yes, I literally had this conversation with my brass rep class at Shenandoah Conservatory yesterday. So it was one of those things where, and also to be clear, the and and I think Lance is specifically talking about traditional instrumentation right like a brass quintet with two trumpets french horn trombone and tuba and neither one of us is in any way saying or even quietly thinking because it would be obnoxious to actually say this out loud that you why would you start a brass quintet because those of us who have come before you have said everything artistically it has nothing to do with that there's still plenty to be said the question is it's frequently uh, and this especially goes for say uh, you know a, a really talented high school kid who's a who's a self-starter who wants to start a group it is very rare that you're going to find five people who happen to play two trumpets french horn trombone and tuba who are all going to be the same ability level that are going to be able to play similar arrangements uh, and that are going to all be in school for longer than three months together because somebody's a senior or whatever uh, it's much more common if you find uh, if you are a trumpet player and first of all my condolences but if you're a trumpet player and your best friend is a bassoon player and you also have a percussionist who wants to play with you then <coughs> the and the the three of you are really good friends right so you've got um what did i just say trumpet bassoon and like let's say marimba Percussion. okay yeah. yeah and bass drum <laughs> <laughs> triangle <Based drum>. uh, <laughs> the the point is that if the three of you are really good friends then it's going to be a heck of a lot easier for you to be scheduling rehearsals right at that point you could be rehearsing at each other's houses when you're hanging out when you finally put uh the controller down from playing Fortnite for like a 95th consecutive hour uh, for a fortnight <laughs> <laughs> wow that was really bad there you go the <laughs> So, yeah, so I think that that's just a little bit more, um, you know, expounding a little bit more on the why thing. What else would you offer as advice, Lance? Well, let's stay with that for just a second. I, I think um, it, it really has to do with the why question goes into the who question. So the why you want to do it, and I'll, I will back up and say that not only do I think that is that my favorite way of making music? I also think that it provides the greatest opportunity for growth of a, a young musician. Yes. Um, maybe on par with the time you spend alone in a practice room. Um, because of the fact that you need to communicate with others, you need to uh, musically and like verbally, you've got, and physically, you know, your, your body language uh, speaks volumes. Um, and your ability, the skill that you need to develop to tell your buddy, I think you're late there, or I think you're sharp, or hey, we're not in tune, um, we need to figure this out, and deciding how are we going to start, how are we going to stop, what are we going to play, um, those questions you don't the rest of the time you kind of get spoon fed what you're going to play in your lessons, and you get spoon fed what you play in your large ensemble, 
And in large ensemble, it's about sort of fitting in with your section and how does the section fit into the overall and you follow the conductor. Um, but in chamber music, you have to, it's all about interpersonal negotiation. Um, so you can take, I don't mean to demean, I made plenty of bread make, you know, playing Bank of Sank Leader and some random, you know, graduation ceremony. So I, I don't mean to belittle that. Is it better than working at a fast food chain? Yeah. Um, but uh, if the reason it goes beyond um, just making a little bit of bread, then it gets really, really interesting and really fun quickly. Yeah, I, to piggyback on that, uh, this is going to be an annoying episode because we're just going to agree with each other on everything. But I'll, I'll I disagree. Just, no, <laughs> I teed that one up for you, didn't I? Yeah. <clears throat> so the now, what was I going to say? Because your your stupid oh. wit just got got in my way. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Now I'm thinking about playing Banga Sangha Leader for some, like, you know, at some Howard Johnson's, uh, you know, <laughs> conference room or something somewhere in middle America. Where? <laughs> well, I mentioned the skills that you develop by a chamber. Music. Yes, thank you. That's um, mm-hmm. That wouldn't really be that hard to retain, but I was up until four in the morning and went to bed angry. So, uh, yay, sports. So the yes, I would actually argue that in some ways, <clears throat> for some young musicians that playing in a, and, and for some instruments specifically, that playing chamber music is actually better than individual practicing. Not that this is an either or thing, right? I mean, you don't have to only choose one or the other. <clears throat> and if you're doing chamber music, then you owe it to show up prepared to be able to rehearse and not just practice your part um, you know with other people present. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, it's especially for an instrument like the tuba, where even in a really good band program, there is um, I, you could you can have a top flight high school band who's playing a difficult program for assessment, and there is a good chance that there's going to be like two or three actually difficult tuba passages in the entire program that your band is working on for three months, and there's virtually no chance that those passages are going to include fast passages that are hard on the fingers plus playing loud and soft and high and low and difficult rhythms and all of those things it'll cover some of that maybe sometimes most of that but the but then how much time each week do you even spend playing those licks right it's uh, it's not in rehearsal it's really not that much time uh, but chamber music like you said especially for an instrument like the tuba or like the trombone if you're not and it's important to note this is chamber music when you're a young kid this is not just for the principal players in the band right you can as long as you have ability appropriate music which your band director a private teacher uh, can help you out with uh lance actually offers free two-hour video conferencing calls to anyone who wants help with rep so um that's right they're hosted by andrew but uh (laughs) i do offer them (laughs) Well, that backfired. I think I need to not try and pick on you this morning because I'm, I'm like I'm always slower than you, but I think I'm like significantly slower than you this morning. So, at least I'm more angry. So uh, the um, so yeah, it's it's um, uh, it's just so valuable for young musicians. I cannot even begin to tell you the benefits that I got from playing in a brass quintet. I started playing in a quintet. At, uh, and guess what? You were saying, why do you start a brass quintet? Well, one of the reasons why is because, as you said, the music is ready to go, right? Yeah, the Canadian brass books, the easy, the intermediate, and, uh, and difficult uh, books, are um, they're really, really, really well done, right? Yeah, they were yeah. our main competition for many years, so I would love to... Um, Excuse me. We we were we were their competition for many years. I think I should uh, I should rephrase that. But um, but so I'd love to say uh, something that's not glowing about it. But those books are really well written. They're really well put together. There's um, there there's a lot of thought went into those arrangements, and they're just they're great. I mean, it's yeah, it's like a band in a box kind of thing. You just buy those books and buy five of them, and you can buy a score for a coach, and then you're and they're not even that expensive, right? It's like a hundred bucks, and your music is taken care of. Um, that that's really valuable, and that's what we did with um, you know in my middle school, and my my uh, my band director um, played along with us because the trumpets weren't the strongest uh, section um, in the you know in the quintet, and he was a trumpet player, so there was like you know him and two kids, plus horn, trombone, tuba. Um, but yeah, it, it, um, but even when he was playing with us, it started to foster independence, which is really, really, really important. 
um, uh, for for this tuba player, it was really important because, as you said, a conductor tells you when to play, when not to play, how long to play, the weight, the beginning of the note, the end of the note. Um, well, the good ones tell you that. The bad ones um, just yeah don't offer anything, and then they uh, blame you when they make mistakes. But um, but sorry, I think that's the uh, four a.m. bedtime talking. So yeah, <laughs> rescue us, Lance. Well, it also you you touched on it. It's much less likely that as a tuba player or trombone player, sometimes even French horn player, that you will play melodies in your large ensembles. Trumpet players probably will, right. um, but you may not as one of those other instrumentalists. And so here's an opportunity for you to play a melody. Or it could be that you're playing a counter melody as a tuba player, and it could be that the, the, the um, pitch foundation is coming from the trombone in a particular section, right. which, oh, by the way, is incredibly valuable for the trombone player to do. So then it allows you to play in those different sorts of musical roles in ways that you can't enlarge on top. Yes. And the best way to learn how to play a bass line or a bass part really well is to get experience playing melodies. I mean, that's really important. Um, and, and actually, uh, along those lines, my wife does this thing which she presents about um, has presented about at multiple state conferences and is actually teaching a course for uh, Fairfax County band directors on Monday nights this semester um, about this but she creates study guides which are <clears throat> which are really brilliant she distills the one two or three main melodies from any piece that she's doing and she writes those melodies out in the appropriate register for every single instrument in the band and so they all get experience playing the melodies um, and uh, and then can. So when you're asking the tubas to follow along with the melody that's in the clarinet, you can actually have them in rehearsal, play the melody on the spot and then tell them to listen for that melody, which is really, really great. Um, most band directors are not going to do that. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So um, mm -hmm. it's just a really good thing to be able to uh, to be playing melodies on instruments that and, and counter melodies, as you said. Tuba can be especially frustrating because euphonium has like the best parts in the whole band. It's like you got melodies, you got counter melodies, you got everything, and we're just like playing footballs and oompa. So, um, but chamber music is the great equalizer. So, yeah, and That's then right. yeah, and then if you're if you stick around long enough, then you get to watch a euphonium player attempt to use a slide, and then then that's also rewarding. <laughs> For sure, you should see it from my side. <laughs> So let's get into maybe a little bit more of the um, we just took, I think, an important tangent, which was like the benefits of it. But let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit more about uh, about the, the nuts and bolts of actually forming a group. Well, yeah, I think uh, that's we are in simpatico today because I thought I think whether you're going to start a uh, uh, regardless of the kind of group you're going to start the nuts and bolts behind are fairly straightforward you start with the who you got to figure out we'll unpack these but basically who's in your group um, how are you going to let the world know that you're doing what you're doing what are you going to charge how do you collect the bread how do you book the gigs all of that stuff I think that a lot of that there's crossover for both um, you know just sort of a gigging group and then if you want to take on the world then uh that initial path is the same same principle and so if you let's assume that you i would my advice to you is to start with who and andrew mentioned it and he was talking about in being um colorblind in terms of the instrumentation i think i would rather have the second best trumpet player uh, as my lead trumpet player in the quintet if they were easier to get along with and they were a better colleague. I know there's differences of opinion about that, um, but that's just my... I, life's too short, and I I would much rather have a good time while I did this as well. Oh, I'd fight that um, point to the death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and no, yeah. you didn't just say eighth best trumpet player. You said second best. Yeah. yeah I, uh, somebody who's, who's more talented, who's uh, a pain in the ass, like, no, 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 and no. Like right. no every day and twice on Sunday. Uh, yeah, life is too short for that. Yeah, it's just yeah. yeah. Somebody that you know ahead of time, you're gonna have to be taking the high road all the time. Yeah, there's there are two kinds of colleagues in a chamber group. One is a colleague where you can say, and also there's a big onus on you here, as you already alluded to, to to be able to in a constructive way say, hey, can we try that again? And can you play uh, with a little bit more attack on those notes? 
You have to be able to say why, first of all. You can't say, like, oh, because the umpire brass recording is the best one, and that's how they did it. It's like, well, okay, if I want to hear that, then I'll play their recording, <laughs> right? I mean, you got to be able to justify it. But there's two kinds of musicians, as long as you put it in a good way. I've played with both. Most of us have. One is that you, if I say that to you, Lance, that you trust that I am trying to change your part because I think it's going to make the group sound better. The other is the one who runs it through the ego filter and and says and and then uh, assumes that you are messing with them, which you got to be real self-centered to go down that road. Um, and I don't know. Do you know any self-centered musicians, Lance? I don't. I don't think I, I haven't do. met one yet. Yeah. I'm op- I'm open to the possibility. <laughs> I'm o- my radar is always up for that. Um, but yeah, they make it about themselves. And then not only are they resistant to your idea, but then they have to make a counterpoint to you that wasn't relevant enough to speak up before. But, oh, yeah, well, actually, you are <laughs> rushing in measure 39. It's like, cool, man. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll thank, thank you. I appreciate that very much. So, um, so, or sure, woman. Sorry, it's not necessarily a man, but it usually is. We're not that bright. So, um, but anyway, I digress. So, yeah, you need, you, the, and the reason why, and Lance nailed it. He said that you have to start with the people. There is a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins, and a lot of it has nothing to do with entrepreneurship in terms of like music and musicians talks about a lot of companies and things like that. But one point on, in that book is one of the most influential points I've ever heard in my life, which is that you need to worry about getting the right people on the bus rather before you worry about where the bus is going. And the thing is, is that if you are, if you've got two trumpets, a French horn, and you're a tuba, and you need a trombone, then you are worried at that point about where the bus is going. And so you're trying to get somebody to get on the bus, but that person has to play the trombone. But the problem is that it might not be the right person. If the direction of the bus changes, then that person's going to be upset because the whole reason why they signed up was not because of who was on the bus, but where the bus was going. And so if you can actually focus on on getting the right people in there, then uh, th- that's just so vital because the right people are there for the right reasons. They're there for the other people. And then whatever you end up tackling, I think, um, is 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 easier when you've got the right the right people in place that that point cannot be made strongly enough. Well, let's pick it up from there because the next part of what Jim Collins says is not only so once you get the right people on the bus, you have to get them in the right seats. So yes. now let's assume that you've got the five people in this example, it's a quintet, um, and you have the folks that you think are going to be your best chance of, uh, of playing good gigs. Well, who is the person that is a good people person and might be a perfect um, choice to be the the booker or talking to presenters or trying to um, land the gigs, the salesperson, basically, who's crazy organized. Maybe that's the person that you put in charge of uh, the library or getting new music or putting them in charge of the scheduling because scheduling is going to quickly become a huge pain in your rear end. Yep. Um, uh, who has the best musical ears? And let's let them be in charge of quality control. Let's let them be in charge of programming. Who's good with numbers and who should be in charge of the bank? So who's going to who do we trust to be in charge of knowing that the money came in and it went to where it was supposed to go? And again, don't let ego get in the way when you figure out who's got the best ears in the band. That does not mean that the other four of you don't have good ears. Right. Like, don't make everything about yourself. <clears throat> if uh, if somebody. Well, I, I was telling a consulting client this the other day who uh, is actually a a patreon patron so uh, thank you allison hello uh but i was telling her the other day that in terms of brainstorming things like names for projects or uh, things like that uh, i'm quite good at that but lance is infuriatingly great at it like it's just like and he's not that smart and he's not that articulate and yet within 30 seconds usually there is at least as good an idea that i came up with after thinking about it for a few days And frequently, it's significantly better. So if I'm partnering with him, I do not spend a week trying to brainstorm something like that. I will just ping him, and then it just falls out of his pie hole, and then I go that, and I can either get frustrated because, like, I can't do that, and I could make it about me, and I could be resentful, and I could, like, hunker down for a week and come up with a damn good idea, 
Or I can just bother Lance, and then five minutes later he responds, and then the name of the project is like is good to go. So it's all about um, <clears throat> it's all about checking your ego at the door, and like, what's the goal here? Is the goal here for you to look good, or is the goal for you to get an awesome name for uh, for whatever, or you know that that kind of a thing? So you just got to understand what other people's strengths are, and it might be your strength as well. But if they're either one percent better than you, or you both are good. But you also have this other strength, like you're also good with money and this person isn't. And so then you let them do the do the brainstorming or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know a quintet that has like a brainstorming person, but you understand, I think, what, where I'm going with this, where you just you divvy things up. And yeah, everything is about the team. Everything's about we and there's no individual credit. You just you just make it work. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of Thanks, man. The, the, the music part of that equation being the hardest one. It's, it's really easy for someone to say, oh, I just suck with numbers. I'm not, yes. I don't need to be there. But it's yes. really difficult to say, I don't have strong musical opinions, yeah. which is not, that's not the implication. Right. But that's kind of what it feels like. That's you what, feel like, well, we I, I, I'm really good. I have, to, I have to contribute in this way. It's much way more about trust. And I need to know that you're in charge of that, so I don't have to be in charge of that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So let's take a moment, Lance, to thank our wonderful sponsors from Duquesne University. Hey, wonderful sponsors from Duquesne University and the Mary Pappert School of Music. Uh, we really appreciate your support. In fact, they have just renewed for another year, which is awesome news. Thank you very much for that. And um, if you want to click on the link in the show notes below, you can find out more about the specifics in terms of who's teaching there, what opportunities there are, how to become a member of the uh, the studio there at Duquesne University. And very, very special thanks. I've just pulled up the list. Thank you, Russell. Um, thank you. To Jim, I don't even understand some of these, so I'm gonna say this one because I don't know I don't know what it means. Are you ready? <laughs> Special thanks to Jim, 1969 Yanko Nova. What? <laughs> I have no idea it what says that here that that is the most powerful of all the Novas or Nove to be scientific. So once again, thanks very much to Jim, 1969 Yanko Nova. There's Jim White Dwarf Nova, which is kind of a Jim White Dwarf Jim Ford Nova. Dwarf Nova. White White Dwarf Nova. That's f- AKA Jim Not Quite Supernova. That's kind of funny as well. So Russell, these these are the gifts that keep on giving. So. so for those of you who did not hear the episode where we talked about this a few episodes ago, one of our Patreon patrons, Russell Edders, who has actually contributed a listener's choice question in the past that we did a, a, an episode on about choosing uh, which college to go to. And, uh, and because they're a sponsor, I would strongly encourage you to consider Duquesne. But, um, but, and also because it's a great school, especially since the Lance doesn't teach there anymore. It's really kind of yeah. open, open things up. So, yeah, he's, like a, he's a big name. I'm trying to say that with a straight face because he plays euphonium. But, yeah, but, you know, he's a, he's, he's a big name, but, yeah, the falter is not really there. So... Um, and he, I'd he, argue if I disagreed. Well, and he also hates teaching and he hates kids. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. Just, it's easier to say he, he hates. <laughs> he, he, he hates. Yeah. Lance, the, the, the put the right people on the analogy, on, on the bus analogy falls flat with Lance because he just wants an empty bus. <laughs> he wants you got to no get the else. right people under the bus <laughs> in the right order. I've been in, I've been in that chamber group before. Yeah. There you go. That's funny. There you go. Yep, you do this long enough, and you're in all kinds of the of chamber groups. So, hey, speaking of which, guess guess who I get to play with today, Lance? Um, fish. Uh, yeah. Yep. I'm flying out to Chicago. I'm going to uh, yep to Rosemont, the Allstate Arena. Hey, congrats! And I'm gonna play with. Fish. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. That'll be good. Yeah, Excellent. I'm not that excited. You know, it's uh, yeah. Oh. I, but should that count as a show attended if I'm actually in the band or or not? Just, like, these are the stat questions that you need to know. Like I saw him on Letterman once. I saw him in the studio, which was pretty awesome. And they played right. a tune. I don't count that as a show. But then one other time, they played on top of the uh, Ed Sullivan Theater marquee, and they played for like half an hour. And I stood outside for that whole time. So, like, does that count as a show? I, so th- these are these are important important questions you, for fish. You stoners haven't figured these details out yet. <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> there's different. See, there's there's different opinions. So, um, yeah, opinions are like 
what is it? What's that phrase? Yeah. Anyway, everyone's got remember. one. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. But let's get back to, uh, yeah, Becky's like, why are they talking about fish stats and what is fish? Yeah, so anyway. No, who are you playing with later today, Andrew? Oh, I see. I wasn't even because I'm tired and angry. I wasn't (laughs) even going to wrap that up. I was just going to dangle that with everybody. Uh, I am subbing with the United States Army Band Tuba Quartet. How about that? Wow. How many people are in that quartet? Well, today there's three. That's why I'm playing with them. Oh, cool. Fantastic. (laughs) That's the problem. They, they, uh, <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, there's a lot of military protocol to change their name to the uh, to the to a trio. So they're they're having me fill in uh, instead. So um, no uniform. What's the gig? The gig is their annual Octuba Fest recital. So mm-hmm. my uh, my kids from Shenandoah, or rather, four of my kids from Shenandoah, are uh, performing uh, as a as a quartet, um, and uh, they're they're going as the Polka Bandits Tuba Quartet. So, That's a good name, and they're not—they're not playing a polka. <laughs> that's even better. Yep, yeah, right. See, that's—that's that's what I thought. They were like, "But we're not playing a polka," and I was like, "Well, I know they didn't have a name, and I needed to give them a name, so I just gave them that because I was in a band. I don't know if I've ever shared this on the Brass Junkies. I was in a band, and we'll put that band in quotes uh, to uh, <laughs> use a liberal definition of that. Have you ever heard this? Maybe I don't know. Um, so. In the uh, the tree lined um, streets of the uh, suburb of Boston that I grew up in, we used to uh, when we rabble roused. It wasn't anything too edgy, but we did have a band called the Polka Bandits, and we would uh, w- there would be anywhere from four to <clears throat> ten of us at a time. We would all pile into two or three cars and we would choose someone's house that we would want to go to at like friday night at 11 p.m uh you know in the in the the quiet suburbs like i mean quiet suburbs yeah this is all like acre lots and like yeah it was was very quiet and we would uh pull up on these side streets with no headlights on uh so that we would come we would roll up in complete darkness we would get out in silence and we would then uh, aim right at the house and then uh, as l- blisteringly loud as we possibly could just out of the darkness and like yeah, <laughs> like trumpets making their lips bleed they're playing so loud and we would play until we saw the first light go on in the house and then we would throw our horns in the car and then we would peel out so that's a good band right, right there it is a good band they were short gigs it was great yeah we knew we weren't getting paid ahead of time yeah yeah it was uh it was good and i'll never forget my uh my well a lot of my friends have gone on to uh have much more successful lives than me but some of them weren't all that bright similar to me and uh one night uh the cops were on to us and the cops there were three of us you know three cars right this is long <laughs> before cell phones right so the, Wait, a, you mean there wasn't like a criminal mastermind there, behind all of this? <laughs> <laughs> no, this here's the thing. I was always the lead. I was always in the lead car, and uh, <clears throat> and I was always driving the lead car. But there were two cars behind me, and then a cop started trailing us. So there's uh-huh. now four cars, and we get to a stop sign, and I turn left, and I'm like, and I'm assuming that my friend behind me is going to be smart enough to like, I don't know, go straight, go straight or go right. Yeah. So then that that friend turns left and then I'm like, are you kidding me? And then the third car turns left and then the cop turns left. And I'm just like, you are not smart. Yeah, it's like we need to just split (laughs) up right now. And they followed me for like three turns and then finally they got it. And it's not like the cop couldn't figure out that we were together. I mean, I think he just didn't want to do paperwork and didn't know what paperwork you would have to do. But eventually we all split up and it was like, and I was, yeah, they were like, yeah, we could have figured that out a little sooner. (laughs) So what are you in for? So, yeah. Well, um, my friend thought I should have turned right, but I had this trumpet that I wanted to play polka music. (laughs) Unsolicited polka music. Fourth time this week. (laughs) Oh, shout out to the Sudbury Police Department. So, yep. So I had a band in college uh, with my best friend, Eric, and we were called the Dead Animals. (laughs) 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 Because the girl I was dating at the time, her roommate worked in uh, a lab that had to process dead animals from time to time and swiped a roll of these dead animal stickers that they would have to put on the outsides of the packages. And she, she had been to our apartment one time 
And so she swipes the stickers and hands them to her roommate and goes, I think your boyfriend would like these. Yes. <laughs> so we had these dead animal stickers that we put on our instruments and we had these plastic pit helmets. And so whenever the right amount of fluids had reached our system, we decided that it was time for a dead animals concert. And so we, we would, you know, whoever was there had to be a part of the band. We had a trash can filled with uh, toy instruments. And so then we would just, any chord or any song with three chords was fair game. And so then the dead animals would ensue. Wow. Yeah, man. And the dead animals actually appeared on my senior recital at Michigan State. And we did like a hee haw set as the encore. Of course. And, <laughs> and I did and I did a fish tune to end my senior recital. Yeah, that's right. Like, Kids, if you're jackasses, just let it let it go. You could actually you can you can actually monetize that someday. So anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah. yeah, no, we so we came out and played we had created a theme song which had three chords and then uh, we told jokes like um, two peanuts were walking down the street, and one of them was assaulted. So it was that kind of uh, high quality humor that we we ended my recital with. That's that's quality. So <sighs> my my freshman year uh, at Northwestern, I lived in the performing arts dorm, and there was a a, a large. It's called the Great Room. It was this large performance space that, and there was a performance hour every week. And sometimes people would like sing arias, and then other times there were some things that were a little less serious. Well, um, I was on the second floor. We were in the red suite, and <clears throat> we ended up forming a a um, a performance art troupe, which was called <laughs> the which was called the Two Red Performance Commando Unit. Nice. And um, yeah, this was on uh, Fridays at eight o'clock was uh, was performance hour, and every week we would sign up with some title, and then we would uh, prepare, if you will, from uh, on a few fronts uh, from starting at 7.30, and we would come up with our idea. And, uh, yeah, actually, that, that uh, performance art got us uh, called into residential life on more than one occasion. So they, they, did, uh, they got to know us. They were like, hello, Andrew. I was like, hello, Brenda. Yep, that was her name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brenda Poindexter. Yeah, we uh, one of my favorites. I won't get into all the details uh, here, but uh, one of them. It's like, it's not a good sign when you don't want to get into all the details um, <laughs> about a performance. Yeah, that's no, not necessarily a good a good sign. But it was right after Nixon died, and it was called uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon and the Knights of the Brown Table, and it was oh like my. A, yeah, it was like an Excalibur thing, and one of the guys didn't have pants on, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, and there was like a sword in the stone thing, but the sword wasn't in a stone. And yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, something. And a dude in a Reagan mask, and um, yeah, throwing fruit that we stole from the cafeteria against the wall. And uh, I think that was the one where we imploded a TV. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, it actually did, in all seriousness, prepare me for a life in showbiz because you get you get rid of those inhibitions quickly when you like half the audience was loving it, the other half was just looking on and just like kind of curious like but morbid horror <laughs> so if this was a pink baby monster concert they would just call it tuesday uh, that is correct yeah yeah see we were um yeah my words not his but we really were the original inspiration for pink baby monster so yeah i'll have to confirm. boys have edge yeah those boys have edge <laughs> all right so so let's get back to let's get back to forming a new brass group uh, so let's what? say that you wanted to form a brass group that was called the two red performance commando unit mm -hmm. and do a richard nixon themed show uh where so well, yeah there's so many there's so many different directions that we can go and well so let's say you've you've figured out you've got the right people on the bus you've got the right people in the right seats so in terms of the business side of it Here's sort of the base baseline minimum that you need. I don't think right off the gate, right out of the gate. Uh, actually, let me pause and go in a slight, um, take a slight tangent. So this is not it's right totally off. It's totally fine, right? It's we're no, we're still sitting on the gate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, yeah. Tell me, uh, the it can work that you have one or two people that are in charge of the group and that one or two people they do all of that stuff and the rest of the players just show up when told to show up and they just sort of play and do the thing and if that's the case then well you should expect to make a little more money if you are not those people you should not complain about the fact you're not making that much more money because you don't have to deal with any of the horse <laughs> pucky that uh, goes into making the gigs happen Preach. so but for this particular description, let's just assume that we've divided the labor uh, equally between the five members of your quintet in this example. 
I don't think that at right out of the gate or on the gate, under the gate, near the gate, you need to worry about incorporating. I think you can handle it just fine as a simple partnership. Um, you might want to set up a DBA, in other words, a doing business as account so that it's just a regular old bank account with uh, Susie Jones on the on the account, or it could be the name of the group. But um, it's enough to have it work that way. And frankly, the check could be made to Susie Jones if you trust that Susie's going to distribute it back out to all of you the way it's supposed to be distributed. Um, pick a name. Um, probably Brass is going to be in the name because... If you're doing a gigging group in particular, it's just easier for people to get that that's a you're a brass group, and that sounds Knights really of the brown stupid. Brown table but... brass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would make it five though. It's like NKOTB, the new kids on the block when they rebranded. So this would be K. What what did I say? Knights of K O T B T B. Yeah, that works. <laughs> I bet that dot com is available since that's complete <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> uh, and actually, in all seriousness, if you're choosing a name, then you need to uh, you need to look on Facebook. You need to look on Twitter. You need to look on Instagram. You need to you need to Google it, of course. You need to make sure that there's a URL available. Um, even if you're not going to do it that seriously, it's you still don't want to be naming your group something that already somebody already has a group name of because if it ends up getting serious, then you're going to run into problems. And then after you develop some momentum, you're going to have to change everything, which is a really bad idea. So, it's yeah, um, yeah that's that's really important. And you want to make sure that all that social media stuff is available, too. Mm -hmm. so, that's right yeah because when someone goes to search it if there's two groups with that thing then th there's only a 50 50 chance that they'll find yours Correct. so yep. just pick a, a more specific one a lot of times people will pick it specific to a region so pittsburgh brass or the boston brass um, but it doesn't have to be that way you kind of have to look at what are the goals of the group and if you want to tie up a particular region and make it kind of clear that we are the you know put a stake in the ground that this is we are the official brass group for this area um, then yeah, go for that. Um, I think getting the bank account set up, getting the marketing materials together, that's all that stuff is very, very important and it won't take you that long. So get a photo. Um, I think in terms of demo, you know, I actually haven't talked to a booker in a long time about whether this matters or not. I would guess that video is way more important than an audio track of a summer or another. I mean, maybe there's some wedding planner out there that uh, wants to listen to it in their car, but my my guess is that they want to see what you look like. So Especially if you're going to for a wedding, I mean, yeah. yeah, you gotta, yeah, you can't look like schlubs. I don't care if you sound like 1986 Empire Brass. If you don't look the part, then then they really don't, then they really don't care. Yeah, and sort of you need to agree if you're a gigging group, um, then you better have formal wear. You know, you better have tuxes, and you better have some sort of um, uh, appropriate stuff to wear at a wedding if you're looking to do oktoberfest things maybe you want to 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 costume it up maybe you want to you know just a lot of it depends on the situation but be you know think through that what is the image we want to give off we're fun we're serious we're um edgy we're young we're more mature we're whatever it is you know just sort of it's it, we're i'm getting at branding basically and this is what what i'm talking about but those are decisions that you need to make based on the market that you're in and the try the kinds of gigs you're trying to get yes and just own that always think about the your potential customer what is it that they're going to be interested in in terms of reading your bio put that first not the fact that you went to some school that nobody cares about um even if it's a really impressive one so what kind of what kind of if you're trying to get on a concert series or a type of concert series, look at the photos of the people that actually get on the concert series. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, sometimes you could actually literally copy one of them um, in terms of, like, the concept, you know. But, like, yeah, if they're, I don't know, if it's, like, a more serious thing. Now, if you're a goofy group, don't claim that you're serious and then go and be goofy. That's not going to end well. But just, yeah, you need, to, you need to do the research of what it is that you're trying, of whoever you're trying to convert into from a potential customer into a customer. What is it that that person is going to be looking for? And then that's what you need to provide for them or else you can't be mystified as to why they're passing. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and uh, Andrew, you said another really important thing, which is you, I you get have less to sleep more often. I think so too. Um, just 
own the decisions that you make. If you decide that you're going to be the serious gigging group, then don't worry about doing the comedy gig stuff or vice versa. Don't try and land every gig. Land the gigs that are the best gigs for you because then as your reputation goes up in that market, then you can start to charge more. Oh, these folks are, let's say, serious. We, these are the, the serious folks. Um, they're incredibly organized. They present themselves very professionally. They always sound great. Not that you shouldn't do those things, but if you establish yourself as the wedding group in your town or in your region, uh, then you can kind of sew up that whole market rather than trying to, well, we do bar gigs and we do recitals and we do church gigs and we do weddings. That's a much harder thing for people to understand. And it's much harder for me, frankly, to believe that you do all of those things equally well. Right. You can hire a handyman that can sort of get, you know, if there's a problem, if the plumbing goes out, I'm going to call a plumber. I'm not going to call a general sort of handyman. Right. I'm going to call somebody who's a specialist in that thing. And I expect that that will cost me more right. because this is a person who has de a depth of, of uh, experience in that area. So just own the market, the, the slice of the market that you're going after, and then try and capture as much of that as you can. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Yeah, if you're a... Uh, if you are a bride or groom to be or a wedding planner and you're on the website for some brass quintet that you might want to have play your wedding and the first things that you see are um you know are photos of you in like a traditional polka garb and you're not having a polka themed wedding then yeah and they're not going to take 5 minutes to search your site and to say like oh so that's just one thing they do they're also not going to get mad they're not going to mm -hmm. really have any opinion they're just going to go to the next one <laughs> Right. They're going to go to the next band, like, and that's just kind of, that's kind of it. So yeah, if you try to, the jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, and are there some musicians? Yeah, we both know some that are total freaks that really can play all, you know, like five different, like drastically different styles well enough that you swear that each one of those is what they were reared on for their, you know, for the last forty years. Uh, those people are rare, right? Those mm -hmm. people are really rare. And you also don't really have time to educate the p potential customer on the fact that you are one of those women or that you are one of those men or one of those people or whatever. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, don't don't try to be everything to everyone or you will be nothing to uh, you'll be nothing to everybody. Right. Yeah, it's that's a, that's a hard point. And uh, well, there are if we were to ask 10 people who listen to the Brass Junkies how we could improve this podcast. Uh, some of the 10 would uh, would say that they wished it was a little bit longer. Some would say that they wished it was a little bit shorter. Some would say that they wished that there were all interviews. Some would say that they wished that there was more of just you and I talking. Um, I, I mean, yeah, everybody's going to have an opinion, and you can't, you can't go with everybody. Um, I mean, like by definition, you can't go with everybody because people can have opposite opinions about the same thing. So you just you got to be you. So right. uh, let's quickly thank Parker Mouthpieces since we're on the home stretch here. And I got to go uh, help my wife who's got a super big gig today. She's soloing with a choir, a really good one. So I need to go cool. relieve her. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you to Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for, I almost said the entrepreneurial musician, which this is not. Lance is Wait, here. That what? means it's the press junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable fine. component mouthpieces for horn, mm. trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including wow. the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece. I, please, I don't write the copy. I'm an artist. I'm an, I'm an artist. And the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. <laughs> Lance, is not a, Lance is not an artist. Who so, didn't know that? A sandwich artist, but that's just his side gig. So uh, find out more at Parker Mouthpieces. <laughs> <laughs> Find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You know, the uh, the subway thing reminds me, my last month in Boston Brass, like this is like my last like couple of weeks, Lance was not in anymore. We were, um, this sums up the music business, I think, perfectly. We had a, the, we had a Kenton gig. That was at Strathmore, which is just an incredible hall right outside of uh, D.C. and Maryland where uh, the Baltimore Symphony performs frequently, the Philadelphia Orchestra performs frequently. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a world-class hall. We headlined there. The place was sold out. I mean, it was like, you know, 2,500 people there. It was awesome. I mean, like top of the world, right? So that was on Sunday. 
on Monday, and uh, on Monday we had a we had this added gig. Our, our gig was on was supposed to be Monday night, and then I found out on Sunday that I couldn't sleep on my own bed. That was super cool. Uh, and then I had to drive to West Virginia because it was like seven hours away. I couldn't even remember the name of the school, but part of our contract, which hadn't been shared with me, was that we had to do like a you know a, a promotional appearance at like noon on Monday, and I couldn't leave at four in the morning so i had to go the night before so the pr- the promotional appearance there was a stage that was uh i put in quotes because it was literally five inches off of the floor i mean it was just something that you would like trip on over on the side of this like small cafeteria room where there was a subway we played for so after headlining at strathmore 2500 people or t- 2000 people whatever sold out um, Kenton gig. We then, uh, less than 24 hours later, played for four students who it was like, this was in December. So they're like trying to finish like finals and studying for finals. Four students and two sandwich artists at Subway was our crowd. So we went from 2,000 people to six people. And the kids were like, kind of like, they turned around and were like, wait, are you kidding me? You're playing those. And it was like so loud. And it was like, it was insane, but that sums up the music business in a nutshell. Every time you think you're a big deal, you're then playing at a subway in the middle of West Virginia for six people, uh, two of which are paid to be there, and the other four who are too lazy to move. So, the the end. <laughs> That's pretty good. In those instances, Lance used to say, "You know, guys, it's not always going to be this glamorous." That's right. I stole that from Dennis Caldwell. That, that was, was always funny. Every time that you said it, it was always funny. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, so I think we should uh, um, do a second part of this because I think there's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't get to. So we okay. should do a part two because we haven't really talked about how do you find the gigs, what right. do you do at the gigs, what do you do as a follow up, what should be on your website, um, and if that, you want to do like a important. <laughs> good point, <all> right? <laughs> well, let us know if you want a part two, part two to this one, we can do it. My um, my advice, which is obnoxious, is that you should just find a, a, a fully formed and successful quintet to join while you're still in grad school, and then you don't have to worry about any of that crap. <laughs> kind of worked for me. <laughs> it worked for me, too. Not the grad school part, so, but the rest of it. Yeah, worked, well, yeah. you know, and then that enabled me to, uh, to stop taking classes that I really wasn't enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> win, win, win. So yeah. unlike the Red Sox last night. So anyway, all right. I need to go and um, and help my uh, my lovely wife with our lovely four year old. So and uh, and our dog, who I think you heard a few minutes ago, so who was uh, apparently mad because probably because some other dog walked by. So the gall of the dogs around here in Virginia, man, they just walk right by your property. It's uh, they're yeah, they're pretty brazen. So. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Lance? I think that's no. I think that's good. So, Becky, thank you very much for your email. And again, seriously, send us emails, people. Let us know what you'd like us to talk about. You could ask us to talk about a specific recording that you really love, or our thoughts on a piece, or specific questions about Boston Brass, or you know, in our in our time there, or uh, things like this, like more kind of uh, music business type stuff or, or really anything. So we love, uh, and we can't get to all of them, but, but we, we love getting emails uh, from people. And, um, and again, thank you to everybody who went to Patreon, uh, went to iTunes, uh, support Duquesne and Parker Mouthpieces. And uh, I think that does it for another episode of The Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Ledoux. We are at pray for yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.